Amen. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the Song of Songs, also called the Song of Solomon. We'll be looking at chapter 2, verses 8 through 17, as well as 2, 7. We'll return to that verse. So Song of Songs, chapter 2, 8 through 17. Uh, the page number here is provided if you don't have a Bible, and there's one provided for you in, in front of you. Uh, or if you're looking in your own Bible for it, you can find the big book of Psalms and then go a little bit to the right, and you'll find the little book of the Song of Songs. This time I invite you to stand if you're able for the reading of God's word. In this poem, it is the bride's voice she is speaking. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, and the crannies of the cliffs, let me see your face, let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet, and your face is lovely. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He grazes among the lilies, until the day breathes and the shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle or a young stag on the clef mountains. This is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer. Father, we pray what we just sang there about these ancient words, these very old words that I just read. We pray that we would acknowledge them to be true, and not just true, but relevant, and so relevant to our lives that they can change us. So we've come, Lord, with open hearts, and we ask that you would let these ancient words indeed impart their truth to us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. My wife and I had a very interesting courtship. Right after I finished grad school, we went on five dates together. Emily then, she's four years younger, Emily was still in college, she went on a, a college trip to the Holy Land, where despite our five fine dates and a dozen or so love letters between one another, that's when you wrote letters to one another before the internet was invented, she, on the trip, she fell for another guy. Yes, she returned to tell me, I can still picture the place in the park where she told me this, I will never be interested in you. Those were her exact words. Well, <laughs> time passed slowly, but it passed. A year or so after that unholy land incident, and by the way, nothing happened with a guy other than the fountain in Rome. Stay away from the fountain in Rome. <laughs> we both decided, Emily and I, we both decided separately, independently, that we were going to be part of our, our church plant from our church in, in Chicago. We were going to go from Wheaton to Chicago as part of the church plant. Now, during that time, I ended up rooming with her younger brother, Bonus. And the pastors of that church, not knowing anything of our past dating relationship, they decided to make us co Bible study leaders for our small group, double bonus. And it was there and then, working together, seeing each other all the time, that the walls of hostility were broken down. <laughs> Put differently, she finally gave in to my persistent pursuit, yes, I will be your girlfriend, she finally said. Now, after dating for a while, a week, I gained the courage to tell her, to tell her just how I felt about her. Cupid had struck me through the heart. The setting was perfect. We were sitting at this campfire at this retreat center. We were all alone. The evening was cool. The fire was warm. I was warm on the inside, but cool on the outside. <laughs> now, as I remember it, I, I wrapped the blanket around her, her body, her cold body, and I said with deepest sincerity, I said, Emily, I love you. All was well in the world. 
until she said, that's nice. <laughs> the rain began to pour, the sleet, then the snow, the, the moon crashed to the earth. I pulled the arrow out of my heart, stupid Cupid. That was the fall. That was the fall of 1998. But then came the spring. The time, as Tennyson put it, when a young man's fancy lightly th turns to thoughts of love. The trees were green again. The flowers were all abloom. The birds returned to, to chants and to coo. The time was at hand. I was ready to propose. The only problem was, I got the flu the day of the proposal. Her brother was supposed to just walk her by, by chance, into this old, ornate chapel by the University of Chicago, and there I was going to be, on the piano. You've never seen me on the piano. I'll have to play for you sometime. Me and the piano, three-piece suit, singing a song that I wrote on the Song of Songs, no less, upon her entrance. But alas, my death was near, or so it seemed. I had this really high fever. I was in bed all day. But Emily, sympathetic soul that she is, she came to visit, and when she came to visit, I decided I'm going to change my plan. I asked her kindly to, to go to the store and get some nourishment for my ailments. In retrospect, she said I barked out orders like I always do when I'm sick. Whatever the case may be, off she went, dutifully and dourfully. Meanwhile, plan B took effect. I got out of my pajamas, I got into my three-piece suit, I pasted these poems that I had written to her, about her, uh, including this song I had written on the Song of Songs, on the wall, and I poised my unshaven, sick-faced self for proposal. Needless to say, when she returned to the apartment, she was surprised. But this time, she was also receptive. I genuflected before her. I told her I loved her. I asked her to marry me. And she said, yes, and also finally, I love you too. I kissed her on the cheek, went back to bed. Very romantic. <laughs> the text before us, if I can turn to that finally, it's a text about timing, about timing. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, come away, for behold, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth. The time, the time of singing has come. The, the time of singing, I love you, and I love you. The time of singing between the groom and his bride. Now with this text, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to explore this theme, this theme of time. Uh, the timing of intimacy, physical intimacy within marriage, and also the timing before marriage within marriage and before marriage. And as we look at what I just read in chapter 2, 8 through 17, I'm going to exhort you, some of you, to trust God's timing for intimacy within marriage. And then as I'm going to reflect back on chapter 2, 7, which we didn't talk about too much or not in great depth last week, there I'm going to exhort others of us to trust in God's timing for intimacy before marriage. So let's get to work here. Evangelical scholars, as they look at the Song of Songs, they there's no debate, there's no debate that there's physical intimacy, and there's no debate that this, this intimacy is taking place uh, within the bonds of marriage. They all agree that a book that is in the Bible that talks about physical relationship between a man and a woman is within marriage. But even evangelical scholars do debate when the first encounter, the first physical encounter, takes place within the song. The majority opinion is in chapter 4, 1 through 5, 1, that that is describing the first physical encounter. It is a poem, undoubtedly, it is a poem about the wedding night. And thus, they say in chapter 2, 8 through 17, what we're looking at today, that is about the proposal. And chapter 3, 1 through 5, perhaps explains the pre-wedding jitters. Chapter 6, 1 through, or 7, 6 through 11, is the actual wedding ceremony. Now, others think that the song starts in the bedroom with a love scene, and from there on out, it is just one earthquake of eros after another. In plainer language, the whole song is set within the context of marriage, in particular the context of physical consummation. Now, I stand in that camp, in that camp. And, and that is, I believe that almost every section 
has imagery that relates to sexual intimacy, including what we've already looked at in the last few weeks, chapter 1, 1 to 2, 6. Now there, if you remember, we read about this king, the man, and he has brought, he's brought the woman, his wife, into his chambers, his bedroom, for what? For passionate kissing. And also the two of them, the next scene, are lying together, and while they're lying together, his left hand is under her head and his right hand is embracing her very intimate posture. And then the poem that we have for today, it too is filled with the language and the actions of intimacy, of marital intimacy. The language is most obvious. Verse 15, he speaks of our vineyards. Now, whether he's speaking literally, they they own some land together, or more likely metaphorically, their bodies are their vineyards. That's how they talk about their bodies. Either way, they possess these vineyards together. They're connected. And then look at what they call each other throughout this poem. My beloved, verse 8 and, and, and 9 and 10 and 16 and 17. And then my love, verses 10 and 13. And then verse 16, my beloved is mine and I am his. That's the language of mutual possession. That's Bible talk for, for leave and cleave and become one flesh. That's covenant formula language. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's the material of marital vows. Do you take this man to be your husband? You're going to possess him in some sense. Do you take this woman to be your, your wife? So the language here tells me that they're married. And we move from the language of mutual possession, we move next to his invitation. He repeats twice for poetic effect, not because she's hard of hearing, although she may be playing hard to get. He says to her, verse 10 and 13, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. He he is inviting her to experience marital intimacy. And then as I'm continuing to make this argument that they're, they're married from the very start of the song, we also have this animal imagery and activity animal imagery and activity. If we've learned one thing from this couple so far is that they really like calling each other names, nice names, animal names. He compares her here in verse 14 to a dove, to a dove that is hiding in the rocks and the crannies of the cliff. Now why is she acting inaccessible to him? That's, that's the image there of the dove hiding in the cliffs. Uh, Why does he need to use tender words to woo her back to himself? Well, the poet doesn't tell us, but he does tell us that woo he does, woo he must. Let me see, he's basically saying to her, let me see your lovely face. Let me me hear your voice. Come fly away with me, my dove, my love. So so he's a dove, a dove that's hiding. But what is he? Is he a roaring lion? Is he a wild boar? Is he an untamed tiger? No, he's not a powerful, dangerous animal, but rather he's a gazelle. That is, he's swift, he's handsome, he's curious, he's cautious, he's strong, but not violent, he's easily excitable, and a sexually eager animal, especially in the spring. Behold, he comes leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle, or young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. So you see, he's not a peeping Tom. Rather, he's a curious George. He's an eager beaver. He's a yearning young young stag. Please let me in, is what he's asking her. Now notice in verses 16 and 17 that his wooing has worked. The dove has stopped playing hide and seek, and she has come out to play more adult games. The poem ends with these words of intimacy. My beloved, he's now mine, and I am his. He grazes among the lilies until the day breeze and the shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or young stag on the cleft mountains. Now, what's going on here? Well, in verse, uh, the final verse, verse 17, along with the first verses, verses 8 and, and 9, they, they share some similar words, uh, notably gazelle, young stag, and then mountains. But notice what's different at the beginning and the end. It's what I'll call, it's called an inclusio. I'll call it a climactic inclusio, what happens at the end. At the end, in verse 17, she invites him. She invites him to intimacy. She invites him to be like an animal in a good way. My beloved be, not my beloved is, but my beloved be like a gazelle 
on the cleft mountain. Be like a gazelle, well, how so? He is to graze and he is to climb. In verse 9, he is gazing. In verse 16, he is grazing. In verse 8, he is leaping over mountains. But in verse 17, he's invited to be on the mountains. So he went from over to on, from, from gazing to grazing. In other words, from looking to touching. Now, what the mountains symbolize, and the lilies for that matter, I will leave to your sanctified imaginations. The one final intimate action, which just adds to my theory here that this is all taking place within marriage, has to do with that tricky verse about the foxes. His final word of invitation to her is, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards, our bodies, are in blossom. Now, here's what I think is going on here. We know from chapter 1, verse 6, that her, her day job, her job before she was married, the family job, was to take care of their vineyards. And we know from other parts of Scripture, from Isaiah especially, what that job entailed. Part of that job entailed keeping foxes out when the, ripes, the grapes were, were ripe, ready to be picked. So he seems to be speaking metaphorically here to say to her, get rid of anything that spoils our feasting on fruit together. In other words, whatever inhibitions you might have about being together, put them all aside and let's, let's eat. Our vineyards, our, blo- our bodies are, are in blossom. It is the right time. It is the right season for love. And so before the foxes come, any sort of distractions, before they come in and take away what we have together, let's refresh each other with fresh fruit. So, I know this is all complex. I know you've got to believe that I've interpreted all the imagery right, which I have. Uh, Here's what's going on. Here's what's going on in this short little poem. Verses 8 and 9. He approaches her because he has great interest in physical intimacy. Verses 10 through 15. He invites her to intimacy. Come away with me. Let's eat before the, the fruit is spoiled and the time is passed. Verses 16 and 17. She accepts. Take me away. Until the day breathes and the shadows flee, that is all night long. Turn, turn towards me, my beloved. Be like a gazelle or young stag on the cleft mountains on my body. This poem, you see, is an invitation to sexual intimacy within marriage. That's what it is. Now, obviously, there, there is nothing prudish here. You might be prudish, but the Song of Songs is not. The Bible is not. God's Word is fully aware of desire, seduction, rape, polygamy, homosexuality, adultery, sex after the age of 90, and that's just Genesis. So if you are shocked by what I'm saying, what this beautiful, very modest, but erotic poem is saying, you shouldn't be. Let your sensibilities, if you learn anything out of this this series, let your sensibilities be shaped by scriptural sensibilities. Now then, having done a lot of work with the poetry, let's get back to that original point, that point of application. Trust God's timing for intimacy within marriage. The point in many ways, it echoes what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 3, 5 which reads, there's a time to embrace, physical embracing between married couples, and there's also a time to refrain from embracing. The point of our poem is there's a time to embrace, so, so embrace. Married couples, God has made everything beautiful in its time, including the timing of intimacy, moments of intimacy within your marriage. So when the time is right and you need to make time, take time to make it right, you should embrace. God gives his blessing upon your embracing. Embrace to the glory of of God. Now, under this first point, I want to talk about actually the second part of the Ecclesiastes verse, just to give a little bit of balance. The song isn't talking about refraining, but I'm going to talk a little bit about refraining because it's also in God's word. There is a time to embrace, but there is also a time to refrain from embracing. That is, I want to be clear as I'm teaching you through the Song of Songs that a a passionate love life, a warm marriage bed is good, but it's not all there is to a healthy marriage. I'll put it this way. There are are more important things than sexual intimacy within marriage. 
Now, there's some obvious examples, like a man who is fighting in a war, a good Memorial Day illustration, who is overseas on a, a mission for many months at a time, who, who willingly sacrifices, if he's a godly man, he sacrifices his personal pleasures, and his wife, she sacrifices too, for the good of our nation. Another example is that of a wife whose husband is, is dying, whether of old age or prematurely, prematurely for some, some reason, some disease or an accident. A wife who day after day stays by his side and nurses him and loves him and holds his hand through the valley of the shadow of death. That intimacy within marriage, I think, is a much higher level, actually, than sexual intimacy. So there is a time to embrace. That's what this little poem is about. But also, as we look at all of Scripture, there is also a time to refrain from embracing. We might refrain for the good of a nation. We might refrain because we're caring for a dying spouse or a disabled spouse, or many other valid reasons. Another valid reason to refrain is for the sake of the gospel, whether it is frontline missions or bedtime prayer. This is what Paul teaches, basically, in 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 7. On one hand, he exhorts singles to remain single, as he is. Why? To secure undivided devotion to the Lord. On the other hand, he exhorts husbands and wives to not deprive one another physically, sexually, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, so not for too long, that you may do what? That you may devote yourselves to prayer. In other words, you fast from physical intimacy for the sake of prayer. From time to time when your bodies are saying, let's eat, one of you or both of you should say, let's just hit the pause button and let's pray. Let's pray because undivided devotion to the Lord and, and seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, it takes precedent over all. It takes precedent over marriage. It takes precedent over the marriage bed. There are more important things than sexual intimacy within marriage. There is a time to embrace. But don't forget there's also a time to refrain from embracing. You see, timing. Timing, that, that's what this text is all about. Now, having talked about timing, trusting God's timing within marriage, I want to turn now to trusting God's timing for intimacy before marriage. So we turn here to chapter 2, verse 7. This is the first of three times in the song where the bride gives this wisdom admonition. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles, by the does of the field, that you do not stir up or awaken love until it so desires or pleases. Now, notice a few facts here. First, notice who she's talking to. Notice who she's addressing, the daughters of Jerusalem. They're the target audience of this whole song. And and these are the young, single, Jewish, Israelite teenagers who are are bridesmaids. They're ready. They're ripe for love. And second, notice that her, her, her counsel to them is to keep in check physical arousal and activity. Keep it in check until the time can be fulfilled with the right person at the right time. And the right person, according to scriptures, is one's spouse, and the right time is after one's marriage vows. And third, notice that what she says to them, uh, uh, this warning to wait, she's very serious about what she says. She says, I adjure you. She adjures, that is, she, she puts them under an oath. She puts them under an oath by the gazelles or the does of the field. Now, those animals, the gazelles or the does, they're already familiar to us. In fact, they're just the feminine counterpart to what she calls her beloved in verses 9 and 17. He is a male gazelle or a young stag. And here in 2.7, we have the female gazelle or, or the doe. Now, what perhaps is not familiar to us is the original language here in Hebrew. The word for gazelles, it sounds a lot like the word for host, the Lord of hosts, a name for God in the Old Testament. Furthermore, the the Hebrew phrase for the does of the field is a very similar sound to El Shaddai, the ancient patriarchal name for God. So the language here, I think, is intentional. It's no slip of the tongue. These these are allusions to God. They're they're meant to uh, uh, heighten the seriousness and the strength of her command. So you can almost think of it this way. She puts her friends under an oath. Do you pledge purity, complete purity, before marriage? So help you God. Now, with all that explained, let me put 2-7 in context of what we studied last sermon. Last sermon, as we looked at 1.5 through 2.6, that poem starts in the pasture, 
And then with, with great poetic license, it ends in some palace of some kind, whether it's indoor or outdoor, literal or metaphorical. In chapter 1, 5 through 10, she, she seeks and she finds her lover. And then I'll put it this way, it's as if the director says, cut, and then the actors, they change their postures, perhaps their, their costumes, and then we start the next act, the next scene, the next take, and action. And guess what? It's another bedroom scene. It's a scene filled with these, these words to one another. It starts in chapter 1, 12, and it ends in 2, 6, and it ends like this, his right hand embraces me. And then cut, and the scene ends. Well, it almost ends. The bride peeks her head out of the bedroom window, and before she closes the shade, she says to seven, you girls wait, patience now, passion later. Promise? Do you pledge purity, complete purity, so help you, God? And the bridal party is to say, we promise. We promise. So that's 2-7. Trust God's timing before marriage. Wait for your spouse. Wait for your wedding day. Wait. That is the wisdom of this part of God's word. But a question might arise in your mind, why? Why would you wait? Why on earth would anyone wait, especially today? This is 2020 AD or almost. It's not 1010 BC. You know, a lot has happened in 3,000 words, 3,000 years since the, these words were penned. We have the pill. We have all sorts of contraceptive devices. And as a last resort, we have abortion tablets for the day after. We have abortion clinics for the months after. So why, why would anyone wait? Well, the answer implied throughout is, is you wait, according to the Song of Songs, because it's worth it. It's really the motive of delayed gratification. You know, other portions of Scripture, they, they'll answer the why wait question differently with the reply, will you wait because there's serious consequences if you don't? There are social consequences. Imagine a so society where everyone is just just picking partners like they pick cell phone accessories in a shopping mall. Whomever, whenever, whatever. Imagine what social chaos and economic disaster would be of these unwanted pregnancies or single mothering, the spread of sexually transmitted diseases, the revenge of angry husbands and boyfriends. Well, we don't have to imagine, do we? That's the world we live in. The Bible speaks of this. It tells us about social consequences. But the Bible also talks about spiritual consequences, a, a seared conscience, that you no longer think what you're doing is wrong. Paul talks about that in Romans 1. And then the coming judgment of God, where God thinks what you've done is wrong, and he'll do something about it, what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 6. You see, other parts of the Bible, they answer this question, why wait, by speaking of serious consequences. There's social consequences, there's spiritual consequences, to sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage. But here in the Song of Songs, there's a very different answer. Here there's nothing negative. It's all positive reinforcement. You wait because there are serious blessings. It's worth the wait. It's the motive of delayed gratification, of opening your Christmas presents on Christmas morning and not Thanksgiving Eve. Now let me ask you, Christian, all of you who are Christians here, do you believe in that? Do you believe in delayed gratification? More specifically, do you hold out in faith for the promises of God? Do you wait like for the bridegroom like those five wise virgins, lamps burning, ready to meet him and enter into the marriage feast? And you join in Paul's elation about the future, longing for that crown of righteousness which is laid up for you, which the Lord is going to award you on judgment day. Can you say with that apostle, with his radical heavenly mindedness, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. Death is gain because only heaven offers full comfort and satisfaction and salvation and inheritance and the ultimate love you're longing for. Christian, do you believe in delayed gratification? You see, whether it comes to something as grand as our salvation or something as good as sexual activity or inactivity, Delayed gratification is as foundational a Christian ethic as love of neighbor. So in a world that says change now and a, a half a million dollar mortgage on a $550,000 paycheck now and sexual freedom now with whomever, whenever, however, more than ever, 
we need to say, no, not now, but then. We need to trust God's timing. We need to believe in delayed gratification. Yes, I think that principle, that theological principle, that ethical principle would, would save our economy. It would renew marriages. It would eventually, if it was practiced by everybody, it would wipe out HIV AIDS would wipe out unwanted pregnancies. It would socially revolutionize our country and the world. And do I exaggerate? I don't know. Let's give God's wisdom a whirl. You see, we're to trust, we're to trust in God's timing within marriage and before marriage. We're to wait. Why are we to wait? We're to wait because it's worth it. But what if we haven't? What if we haven't waited? Well, thankfully, the Bible has one more grand point. Trust in God's forgiveness through Christ. Trust in God's forgiveness through Christ. Or if we want to keep with the time theme, trust that in the fullness of time, God sent his son to redeem us from these elementary principles of the world, such as the popular principle, if it feels good, just do it. Listen, I'm not ignorant of the world we live in, and God certainly is not ignorant. God knows that human beings are sinful. God knows that all human beings are sexually sinful. But God hasn't left us to ourselves. He sent his son to heal the sick, to, to free the slave, to forgive the debtor. On one occasion, one of my favorite stories in the gospel in Luke 7, Jesus, remember he's invited over to Simon Pharisee's house for dinner. And this is what happened as Jesus is reclining at table, his feet are out back, and he's eating his food at the center of the table. Uh, Luke records, behold, a woman, a woman who he calls a woman of the city who was a sinner, likely a designation for a prostitute. Behold, she comes in and she brings in this, this alabaster jar that's filled with expensive ointment, and standing behind his feet, she begins to cry, and she weeps so much that she covers her feet with her tears. She's made an absolute mess. And then she does the unthinkable. She she takes down her hair. A Jewish woman would never take down her hair except in the company of her husband and him alone. She takes down her hair in front of Jesus and she she wipes his feet with her hair. And then the scene gets even crazier. She she begins to kiss, to kiss his feet and, and anoint them with perfume. Now, Simon the Pharisee, he is sitting there, and he objects strongly. He said if Jesus was a prophet, he would know what sort of a woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. But Jesus, either sensing this or overhearing it, he replies, Simon, let me tell you a story. And he goes on to tell a story, and here's the story. He says, a a certain money lender had two debtors, and one owed $10,000, and the other $1,000. Both of them couldn't pay. And so what the man did was he canceled the debt. He, he forgave the debt of both. Now, which one of them, Jesus asked, which one do you think will love him more? And Simon answered, well, of course, the one who had the, the larger debt canceled. And Jesus said, right on. And then he turned towards the woman. And he said this to Simon, Luke's exact words. Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, the the traditional sign of hospitality. But she has wet my feet with her tears. She's wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, a traditional greeting. But from the time I came in, she, she has not ceased kissing my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, another traditional custom, but she has anointed my feet with ointments. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven because she loved much. He was forgiven little, loves little. And then he turned to her and he told her, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Perhaps you're asking this morning, what if I haven't been sexually pure? What if I haven't waited for marriage? What if, what if I'm even in my marriage, I'm that sort of a man or I'm, I'm that sort of a woman? Well, the answer is that God offers forgiveness for sins through Jesus Christ and that you need to trust in that forgiveness. That Jesus came for sinners. Jesus lived with sinners. Jesus dined with sinners. Jesus died for sinners. Jesus rose for sinners. And, and Jesus now stands ready to accept all sinners who repent and trust in him. Jesus didn't come for the righteous, those who think they don't need him. He came for sinners like you and me. And so we need to, 
we need to come to him. And I did. I did nearly 30 years ago. I came to Christ as a sinner. As a secular, sexu, secu, <laughs> sexual sinner. Some of you know my story. For those who don't know or, or have forgotten, here, here's the shortened form and you can cry along with me. I grew up in a very devout uh, Roman Catholic home where virginity was prized. Where, where I was taught you wait for marriage and you wait for marriage, not because it's worth it, but you wait for it because it's right and you just do the right thing. But I knew, like all my friends, I knew that love is what justified sex. So if you were emotionally mature enough, if you had a consenting partner, someone who had deep feelings for you, you had deep feelings for them, well then, what happens, happens. Well, what happens, happens, happened to me. I fell in love, and that feeling of, of love, it justified all emotions of lust, it justified all inappropriate actions. And such love also, sometimes, it, it actually produces children. And that's what happened to me as well. At the age 18, my girlfriend was pregnant. At the age of 19, I was the father of a baby boy. And when my boy's mother moved on from me, our true love didn't last forever. It didn't even last 20 months. That is when God's saving grace moved on me. Jesus, forgive me, I prayed. One night on my knees. And clean me up on the inside. Because I'm full of lust. And I'm full of pride. And you know what he did? He cleaned me up. Now I share that because I want you to know when I say trust in God's forgiveness through Christ, I mean it because I've experienced it. I used to be that and now I'm this standing before you. I, I've been washed, I've been sanctified, I've been justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. I share that so some of you this morning might, might come to the living waters of Jesus Christ, waters that can cleanse your sin and that, that thirst you feel. I share that so you might come to Christ, your, your creator, the one who holds all things together, who created the world, who renews creation each spring, who will bring about new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, who, who now even creates new creation, saving sinners and bringing them into the firstborn of all creation and who are now as new creations. In his sight, they are as fragrant as flowers and as sweet as pomegranates, as melodious as the tunes of turtle doves. I share that so you might hear this morning the voice of the bridegroom, the one who says your sins are forgiven. Neither do I condemn you. Go in peace so the joy of forgiveness for whatever your sin, sexual or otherwise, might be yours this morning. I share that so you might know the love which surpasses all understanding, the love of God in Christ, the love of Christ the King, who will come in power to judge when the fig tree ripens, and who has already come in love as a shepherd who has laid down his life for his sheep to offer forgiveness to all who claim in faith. My beloved, he is mine, and I, I am his. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the greatest love story of all, that you sent your own son to take on all of our sin, our sexual sin, sins of pride, sins of gluttony, sins of vanity, all sorts of sins, Lord, every sin on earth he has taken upon himself, and he has made us pure, absolutely pure, virgin pure, in your sight. And we thank you, Lord, for that gospel. Thank you for that gospel that changed me nearly 30 years ago and continues to change me and help me. Lord, I pray that this testimony of this little poem and my own testimony of how you changed me might be used this morning to change others here who are struggling with their identity, struggling with who they are in or out of Christ, struggling with the church, struggling with their sin. I pray that you would soften their heart and invite them this spring to see things afresh. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.